This is Kevin from Anglican TV. We're doing a quick press conference in Atlanta, Georgia, where we're having a joint Anglican Synod um, for the first time. And I've been talking to lay people here and clergy here, and it's almost like this is a foregone conclusion that you're going to leave here together. Um, I've been to many Anglican events. There has never been a foregone conclusion. Um, Please introduce yourselves and tell us how we got here. Uh, Bishop Grundorf from the Anglican Province of America, and uh, my headquarters are in, in uh, Oviedo, Orlando, Florida. And uh, uh, we have, uh, we're here uh, because we're interested in seeing the uh, continuum uh, come back together and to work together in a unified effort to uh, bring traditional Anglican uh, to the to the church and to the forefront, so we're we're very excited about this. We've done a, a lot of preliminary uh, uh, meetings, and uh, the archbishops have all uh, become friends and worked together, uh, preparing the way. And so now we're 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 following through with the plan, and uh, we. So far, uh, and, and we're coming down to the end uh, of the week, and uh, at least from our perspective, everything has gone very, very well, and our people are very excited about the, the possibilities uh, of unity in the church. Um, what's the hardest part about bringing the continuum together? Well, I, I think doctrine has not been an issue. We're in full agreement about the ordination of women, about uh, the value of traditional liturgy based in the historic prayer books, about moral teaching uh, concerning the sanctity of life and traditional sexual morality. So those issues have not really been difficult. We have uh, had in the last 40 years um, splitting and fussing, much of it based probably on personalities. Um, and so sometimes we have to overcome historical uh, separation. We've grown just differently and then sometimes actual conflicts up between people. But really the process has, I don't think, been experienced as something terribly difficult. It's, it's been fairly natural and I think we're all feeling relief. Mm -hmm. okay. I think one of the things that uh, Archbishop Haverland has brought up is the past history of the last uh, 40 years. And of course, biblically, uh, 40 has a great deal of significance. It's the gaining of wisdom, a sufficient amount of time, the wandering in the desert. But it's also uh, the continuing church grew out of a series of, uh, well, who are we? Trying to find our identity, trying to find our way. And there were personalities, certainly, that, that, that struggled to do that. And it was oftentimes very contentious during those 40 years. And uh, we're fortunate, having been in this generation of leaders of the continuum, that it's come to us, as uh, Bishop Hewitt said earlier today when we were having breakfast, that we are the, in a position to be conciliators and uh, to work by, by consensus. And that's been one of the joys of this. So getting over our past history has been a challenge, but we recognize that as mature Christians, uh, we do need to adopt a forgiving and uh, uh, accommodating approach. We're not perfect. No one is perfect. But within the councils of the church, we have learned that our imperfections can be overcome when we enter into uh, a council in the presence of Jesus Christ. And that's been really uh, an incredibly rewarding part of our journey and uh, part of uh, this joint synod today and, and this week has been bringing people together in joy to experience the fullness of the church. One of the most remarkable things is having 500 voices, for example, in the chapel singing. And every one of them is bringing their gift of song and of the joy of being together. And that's a powerful witness to what we're all about. One of the things anybody who's gone to churches in the last 20 years has noticed is our churches are dwindling. And um, is this uh, desire for unity a way to overcome uh, 
the dwindling this to show people unity, something together. I see you at so many uh, ecumenical uh, events. Um, is ecumenicalism the way forward? I think there's a synergy that develops as we, we enter a kind of promised land after 40 years, mm -hmm. and there's a synergy in that promised land that allows us to cooperate, to work together, to share resources. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. If you've got a better youth camp, we go to yours. and We swap all kinds of uh, resources that uh, create a kind of upward spiral, spiral in our common life, and that, uh, that helps, uh, helps us to grow. I think we're going to see a, a, a new time of growth in our parishes. We're, we're seeing new parishes opening up. Uh, there, there's a new spread of missions, new commitment to missions, and uh, uh, we're seeing more youth work on campuses, and I think we're going to see uh, uh, something exciting in the coming decade. One of the things that, that's uh, impressed me uh, dealing with our province is how many of our, our um, uh, parishes are now attracting younger families and most of these families are from evangelical backgrounds and they're in search of the uh, uh, of, of authentic um, mm. liturgy and uh, and biblical preaching is always a part of that and uh, but uh, just a, a, a music tradition that that uh, has a great substance to it, which has always been part of the traditional Anglican way of doing things. And uh, uh, so our, our churches, uh, the growth that we're experiences, experiencing is coming from the evangelical community and uh, many cases younger people with, with lots of families, which is really great because they have lots of kids. Uh, and uh, so we're, we're experiencing kind of a, a uh, uh, renaissance in that area. And those uh, people are, are, they're not looking for the evangel evangelical church in, an, in a uh, slightly Anglicanized form. Right. I, think, I think they what they really want is traditional Anglicanism. This, they, this, they <coughs> no, they don't. No, they're, they, no, they are not looking for that at all. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, in one case we thought, well, maybe we should introduce uh, something a little more... Uh, 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 update and, and uh, uh, with a changing of music and, and, and maybe uh, make the liturgy a little more modern. We, we've, we've tried that, sticking with, uh, with what we have, but, uh, but, but modernizing it, they weren't interested. You know, they wanted it, uh, the, the, the traditional prayer book, the traditional hymns, organ music, and I'm telling you some of these, our churches now, have some of the best music, uh, uh, traditional music that that you can imagine, and uh, and and oftentimes it's done in circumstances that aren't quite as fine as as some of the uh, churches that we we know are thought of as the big musical churches. But but it's really interesting to see how this is developing, and uh, and and what we've noticed is once you get a community of younger families like that with children, they attract others. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, to, to come as well and introducing them into the community and the family which is really uh, quite gratifying I'm, I'm very uh, in, uh, enthused and, and excited about the future the secular world is is one that we all have to contend with and many churches have gravitated to the fads and uh, the current events that are happening uh, however, the most important thing that, that we uh, offer is that solidity that we were, we're talking about, that dependability, that biblical faith, and our faith is derived directly from Holy Scripture and the traditions of the church, the ecumenical councils and things. Those are things that are eternal, fads and, and, and various things do go out of fashion. And what happens? What are you left with when that, in fact, happens? Um, Bishop, uh, both Bishop Hewitt and Bishop Grundorf have spoken about the, the gifts that are, that are brought. The gifts that in our churches are the, the wonderful tradition of music that we have, the wonderful theological traditions that we have, and once you begin tossing them out, you lose the spirit of the church. And we believe that God goes where God is wanted, and those churches are, are growing. Uh, and, 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 and thriving. And also one thing that we have learned which is extremely important is that each of us, and uh, Bishop Hewitt alluded to this, each of us brings a certain gift. 
And that's the power of it, and it's the power of this event too. And I think that also, as far as growth is concerned, seeing what has happened this week will certainly encourage others to come along into this, into this movement, because it is, a, it is a message of incredible power, of people that have been separated, who have chosen to come back together to do the work of the church, to offer a level of forgiveness and recognize that we serve always and only under the banner of Jesus Christ. I heard somebody yesterday, I think it was you, said grow uh, uh, together or wither apart. Uh, something to that. that right. I, a laywoman in Colorado said the problem with the fracturing of the continuing church movement after 1976 to 78 when Congress of St. Louis in 77, of which this is now the 40th anniversary, first consecration 78. The fracturing that followed left us uh, as puddles, and these separated puddles will dry up if they remain separated puddles. But if we uh, can add them to each other, then it becomes uh, a, you know, a pond or a lake with, with more depth which can survive temporary droughts, you know, extend the metaphor. Mm. Uh, so I think, I think that's, that is a, <coughs> a helpful thing. There is a synergy, uh, there is a uh, uh, confluence of gifts. Um, there's also a geographic uh, complementarity. Mm -hmm. Bishop Marsh's diocese is very strong in uh, New England. Um, Bishop Grundorf is very strong in Florida. Bishop Hewitt's very strong in South Carolina. The ACC in California has mm -hmm. strength. Uh, so some pl places, one group will be stronger, and mm -hmm. if you put them together, then we have pretty good coverage of the country. If an existing member moves, he or she's more likely to find some place to go to church and not be lost to the continuing church if we can cooperate. It's not a panacea, it's not magic. You can pool incompetence, you can pool failure. Mm -hmm. um, I was told uh, years ago that in 1900, the three Methodist churches in England began talking about merger. It took them 20 years. Mm -hmm. They merged around 1920, and the merged group was smaller than any of the original three. Mm -hmm. right? So it, it's not a panacea, mm -hmm. it's not automatic. But I think all that we have said about uh, about the synergy is, mm. is correct. Mm. Yeah. In Europe and other parts of the world, Anglicanism is falling apart. Uh, it's just not standing up to culture. Uh, does your Anglicanism stand up to culture? Yeah, I mean, I think that's what we have. We have integrity, uh, and it means we're tiny. And it means we have um, had difficult times. It means we walked away from buildings and incomes and jobs uh, years ago. But um, we are not compromising uh, on doctrinal matters, theological matters. We're not single issue. We're not obsessed about one issue or another. But we believe that we do not have the power or the right to alter the faith where the tradition is clear about a central matter, such as the male character of priesthood. It's not we don't want to change, maybe we would like to, but we don't have the authority to alter what is given to us clearly by the consensus of the church. The, um, the short answer to your question, are we standing up to the culture, to the society, is yes. And historically, the church has always reinvigorated itself. You know, there, there's an old phrase that uh, the, the genius of Christianity is that it can always dig itself out of the grave. It is that resurrection spirit there. And oftentimes, the spirit of the church and the resurrection of the church throughout history has come from small churches that have maintained the true faith. And that's something that we believe. If we maintain the faith, the faithful will be there, fulfilling the tenets that we have received from Jesus Christ and from Holy Scripture is something that is vitally important to God's holy church. And standing up to secular society is something that the true church has always done. 
uh, when the secular society has gone astray. Those are the teachings that, that the church has that, that oftentimes exist in opposition to the secular society. But we have to be faithful to the tenets uh, and the, the treasures of the church that we have received. So going forward, you know, this is a joint synod. Um, are we just going to have a unified synod um, after you guys sign a document tomorrow? What's your, what's your path forward after this? As I want to finish up so you guys can right. pitch your next meetings and grab lunch and uh, all the stuff that you need for to sustain yourselves. When we leave tomorrow, what's your next step together? Well, one of the things that, that we've found from past experience is that uh, trying to uh, merge prematurely uh, without, uh, without everyone in the sort of rank and file, uh, figuring out uh, who they are and and uh, and and knowing the the, the other folks, uh, that's why it's so critical. I I said to my synod today, uh, you're going to have opportunity to uh, socialize with folks that are from the other jurisdictions. Uh, it, the easiest thing and the convenient thing is to associate and and meet with and around your friends and those you know uh, but step out of, of, of your comfort zone and and start meeting up with and, and talking with people who are from the other jurisdictions because this is where uh, friendship is is, a, is such a huge part of, of coming together you have to know and you have to get to like each other and realize that you're both all of you are trying we're all trying to do the same thing and get to the same end and uh, we we're never it's never going to be perfect we're never all going to uh, agree with each other on everything but but we know that uh, that's where it really begins it, it is a, a personal thing and, uh, and and we know that when people come to your church they if you let a, a young a new person uh, stand around after church and, and no one uh, uh, and you know associates with them or engages them in conversation, uh, the likelihood of them coming back is pretty remote. Uh, it, it does take that personal touch. And I think one of the w reasons we come together like this is for us to, uh, not just the clergy, but also the laity, to, to uh, involve themselves with each other. And we see this happening with, with organizational, uh, 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 just women's organizations and, and uh, and uh, these are kinds of things that these women get to know each other and, and can build relationships uh, so critical in, in this whole matter of coming together. Well, I guess I want to thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for your efforts. You know, I, I love to, in my travel, see John 17 fulfilled. <laughs> Amen. <coughs> you know, you know, we're famous for recording and not being fulfilled. So thank <laughs> yeah. you guys for being faithful. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.